Hello everybody, I'm Rainbow and welcome to Dimensional Walking. Today's video is going to be about a story that I heard early on in the 2000s. And back when I actually had watched different interviews of this story and watched videos of the story, I it, it never occurred to me that this story wouldn't be in mainstream media. But as the years have passed, it it wasn't. And what was really interesting about this story is that it's kind of been lost and it's not actually easy to find. I had to really do some digging to look into the interviews that were done about Jonathan Reed and to in which he was interviewed by Art Bell two to three times and to see some other videos of experiences that uh, of his encounter with an extraterrestrial now his story should be as big as Travis Walton's story uh, Travis Walton had a movie done of his experience called uh, Fire in the Sky Jonathan Reed didn't have that luck. Now, not all experiences with extraterrestrials are the same. While Travis was abducted or he was taken up into a UFO and he had witnesses, Jonathan's story is a bit different. Now, he does have witnesses, but his witnesses were in a different way. Because Jonathan, his experience changed his life forever. And he found himself having to be on the run. Now, there's going to be people who are going to hear the name Jonathan Reed, who may know of his story, who are going to go, oh God, I can't believe she's even talking about this. Well, if you're one of those people, I'm going to suggest that you just skip this video and don't watch it because I, for one, believe Jonathan Reed. And the reason why I believe him is because of my own experiences. And uh, I think that his life being altered the way that it was is much more extreme than, than my life. And I feel for anybody who's, whose life has been altered by an experience that was shocking, catastrophic. And the, the one thing about Jonathan is he wasn't into sci-fi stuff. He wasn't into aliens and UFOs and any of that stuff. It wasn't in his, his world. He was a psychologist, and I believe he was a child psychologist. And his story is one that um, was actually, unfortunately, was placed into the mainstream because of a show called, I think, Fact or Faked. And they believed that his story was a hoax. They, they felt they could do everything that he, he did. I find that very strange because they couldn't replicate uh, the, the blood and tissue samples. They couldn't replicate some of the artifacts that he actually had in his possession. So there's a lot of things that just didn't make sense. And I think that it was an opportune time for whoever wanted this to go away. It was an opportune time for them to actually have this story put into the mainstream media so that it would go away. So listen to the story and you tell me what you think in the comments below. I believe this man. I think that he he had an experience that changed his life forever. In the beginning, not for the better, because he lost everything. So, you know, you be the judge and you tell me what you think. So here we go. The story of Jonathan Reed should be as well known as a Travis Walton abduction. What makes this story stand out is the fact that there are no similarities to the Travis Walton case, but it does have one thing in common, an extraterrestrial. 
One caveat here is that Jonathan Reed is not his real name. He changed it after he left Seattle, Washington and lost everything. Listen to the story, and even if you don't believe it, realize that this man's life changed, and he lost everything he held dear to him. That's quite a price to pay, if this is a hoax or for five minutes of fame. So, five minutes of fame, and you lose your house, you lose everything. There's more to the story. In 1996, Jonathan Reed lived in Seattle, Washington, and was a psychologist. And I believe he was a child psychologist. He also had a dog who was a golden retriever named Susie. I remember years ago him saying he was a child psychologist, as I just stated. He asked, excuse me, he used to take walks up in the mountains with Susie on a regular basis. On this one fateful day, Jonathan took Susie up on a trail that they walked multiple times. It was later in the day, so they had only a few hours to enjoy the walk before needing to get back to his Jeep. Susie went ahead of him, walking along, enjoying herself, and within eyesight of Jonathan. But at one point, she took off at a dead run as if she saw something that he didn't see. He yelled at her, but she was out of sight. All of a sudden, he heard her growl and then yelp, crying for help. And as she cried, he started running, yelling her name, trying to get to where he heard her crying. As he got to the location where he could see her, he saw something that horrified him and would forever change his life. Susie had bit the arm of what looked like a child at first, but Jonathan could see it was something that he couldn't identify. This creature was shaking, trying to get Susie off its arm. To Jonathan's horror, the creature ripped Susie from snout to chest, and she ended up changing into ash. It happened so fast, he couldn't help her. So this alien just took her, ripped her from the top down to here, and as this happened, she just... From whatever he was able to do, she just went into ash. He was in shock. Jonathan yelled and picked up a branch near him and went to strike the creature in the head. As he did so, the creature let out a scream, as did Jonathan. So the moment he struck the creature in the head, Jonathan fell to his knees and was horribly sick. He had no control of any of, it, of his extremities. He vomited as well as soiling himself. He was hyperventilating and was becoming dehydrated quickly. He took out water from his backpack and looked at the creature unconscious, possibly dead on the ground. His dog in ashes, and he was in total shock. As he got a hold of himself, he started to look around the area where this creature was standing. To further his confusion and shock state of mind, there a short distance from this creature was a craft that was hovering above the ground. It was a dark granite color shaped like an obelisk. He walked over to where it was hovering, not moving, looking at it. At one point, he leaned on it and the surface tore off some of his skin on his hand. He had no idea what he was looking at or what the creature was on the ground. Being an avid photographer, Jonathan had a camera in his backpack that he took along his walks. He then proceeded to photograph the craft and the area that was around it. One caveat here. This was before CGI, Photoshop, or AI. The photos he took are all original. So at this point in time, just remember that there was nothing available for him to be able to fake the images. Those images are the probably the core reason why a lot of people debunk the story because they are so good. And even Art Bell stated, 
problem is that they are really good photo uh, photography. That was because Jonathan liked to take photographs. He was an amateur photographer, but he took good photographs. So just understand that this is way before he could have gone off and done something. As he walked to the creature, he saw that it, let's say, okay, let's skip the part, sorry. He knew it was getting late and his vehicle was far away. He was still vomiting at this point and realized that he needed to figure out what to do with the creature. He knew it had a, he had a thermofoil in his backpack, so he decided to put it in, wrap it around it and try to put it somewhere to where he could just place it and get rocks and things and put it on top of it because he thought he had killed it at that point. As he walked to the creature, he saw that it was bleeding on the back of its head. He was having a hard time looking at it, so he took the blanket out and immediately wrapped it up. He picked it up to see what it weighed, and to his amazement, it was pretty light. He said maybe 50 pounds at the most. He thought he would just leave it and put rocks on top of it, but he couldn't find any uh, many of the rocks in the area because the topography didn't have that, that many. So, I mean, if you live in the Pacific Southwest, you know, if you go up for walks, you see lots of ferns and stuff like that. There's not like a, a ton of rocks everywhere. Depends on where you go, though. Because of this, he decided to try and take it with him. He picked up some objects and things that were around the creature and put them in the blanket with it. He picked it up and put it over his shoulder and started back to the Jeep. Now, I want to tell you guys something that. As soon as Jonathan hit that creature, and he calls it a creature at this point because he didn't know what it was, he, he got sick. It was like the minute that he hit the creature and it yelled, it affected him. And so it affected him the whole time he was there and affected him the whole time that he was going back to his vehicle. He was just sick and shocked beyond belief and had no idea what was going on. He had to take many breaks every so often to rest. He was still sick and vomiting. Jonathan said something that was quite interesting about the hike back. He said it felt like it only took 20 minutes when it was a much longer hike. He felt it was his state of mind or could it have been the extraterrestrial. At this point, just remember, he doesn't know this is an extraterrestrial. He has no idea what it is. He put the creature in the back of the car and headed back to his home. On the drive back, he really thought he hallucinated what happened and that wrapped up in the blanket was his dog, Susie. Once he got home and he took the bundle out of his car, it was made obvious that he did not hallucinate. He put the creature into a meat freezer in his garage. He closed the lid and went into the house to shower and to figure out what to do. He decided to call his girlfriend first, who didn't pick up, and then a very close friend, Gary, who said he would be right over. When he told his friend what happened, his friend didn't believe him and thought he must be imagining things. So he took him out to the garage so he could see for himself. He took the, cre the creature out of the freezer and put him on the floor unwrapping him. His friend stood in disbelief and was the one who stated that he was an extraterrestrial. They went back to the house trying to figure out what to do next. And it was his friend, Gary, who came over, who actually ended up naming this extraterrestrial Freddy. He did take the alien out of the freezer to examine it, and this is later on. And he decided to record this as he was touching its head, its eye, and its mouth. He said he even tried to cut the material off the, of the bodysuit that the alien was wearing. The first cut, he noticed it started to close itself up. He cut it a second time and saw that it closed immediately. And the third time, it didn't allow him to cut it. He said it was as if the material was somehow sentient. So it knew that if, if he was going to try to cut it, it, it didn't let him 
And he felt that this was technology that down the line, he had heard that our government actually had, which I find that really interesting. Within the next three days, Jonathan called many friends and colleagues. His girlfriend came over and other people to see the alien. He said he eventually wanted to have someone examine the body. What he didn't know was that when he took the body in and out of the freezer, the extraterrestrial was still alive. He actually ended up taping a gaping wound that was bleeding in the back of the head. Part of the scalp was hanging down, and that's why he taped it up. He contacted a professor who was a friend at the university where he was employed with at the time. He set up a date for his friend to come over. Now, just remember that the alien was still being kept in the freezer. As the date and time came, his friend didn't show up. He called him and asked him where he was, and he's, he was told by his friend that he wouldn't be able to come to the house. This friend, this colleague, was threatened. With this unfortunate outcome, Jonathan reached out to a neighbor that he was close friends with. The neighbor came by and Jonathan opened the freezer lid and both men were shocked and horrified because there in front of them was the alien conscious and alive. At that moment, the alien let out a scream that was like a vibrational burst of energy pushing back at them. It still couldn't move and escape, but at that moment, Jonathan decided not to do any more examinations. Both men ran inside the house and sat in silence and shock. Hours later, Jonathan went back out to the garage to see if the alien was still there. He was concerned that it might try to hurt him since he was the one who inflicted the blow to its head. As a few days passed by, the alien tried to communicate with him through telepathy. When the alien did this, Jonathan got really bad headaches, so he told it to stop. He said it didn't take any food from him, only water. It didn't have any excrement matter coming from it. He said that the only foul smell coming from it was the smell of something like rotten fruit. He said he just tried to live his life the best he could, but he couldn't. By the time the alien could get in and out of the freezer by itself, it was about three days. Jonathan also hypothesizes that it, the cold temperature may have helped it heal. One day when he was going back home from his job at the university, he saw two vans slowly go by his house with government license plates. Here's a very interesting part of the story. After this, three men in black came up to his house and knocked on the door. He let them in. He said they had a strange energy to them, almost like he felt like he was sleepy. They told him they knew what he had and demanded that he surrender everything to them. He told them to get the hell out of his house, that he would call the police. They got up, went to the door, and told him that the police were with them. They left, and when he looked outside, there was a Seattle police car across the street. When they drove away, the police car followed them. Just after that, he came home from a friend's house when he noticed bands on his front lawn and men taking things out of his house. He said he just didn't want to deal with it. He was freaked out, scared. So he drove away and waited for them to leave. When he got back to his house, he said they took electronics, a cord of wood. And when he went to look in the garage for the freezer, he said it was gone. But he did notice wet footprints that went from where the freezer was to the wall that seemingly disappeared going through the wall. So he felt maybe Freddy got away. By the time this happened, he said he had already sent off the different pieces of evidence he collected from around the alien to friends so that they would be safe. He said that they depleted his bank accounts, threatened his friends, erased any aspect of his life as a psychologist. He lost his home, his way of making a living. At this point, he left his life in Seattle, Washington, and went to Canada. 
Jonathan claims he's been on the run ever since because of death threats. He states he's been beaten up three times by agents, shot in the shoulder, wrestling a gun away from a stranger, and that he has had friends killed since the encounter with the alien. Now let's talk about the one object that belonged to the alien that he had with him. It's a silver cuff, but what he calls, but he calls it a link. And, and actually, he believes that it's a bioelectric interface between the wearer of the cuff and the owner of the cuff. It has three needles on the inside that penetrate the arm of the wearer. It keeps control and communicates between the extraterrestrial and their superiors. So he thinks it's that communication between this particular alien, his superiors. But what happens when somebody else puts that cuff on? On a live Mexican TV show, and I couldn't figure out the date on this. So you figure if that happened in, in uh, 96, that it probably is, was in the 2000s when, or late, late 19... 98, 99, early 2000s when this was probably happening. I'm not quite sure, but it had to be not that far off from when all this happened, probably five to six years or so. On a live Mexican TV show, Jonathan just demonstrated what happens when the link is put on a person's arm. He put it on himself. He made it clear that sometimes it functions and sometimes it doesn't. He then put it on and started talking about how it felt. The first thing he said was that it felt cold, almost like a frozen type of feeling. He felt a throbbing in his chest, literally a pulsation inside his chest that went to all of his extremities. There was interference with the television cameras. Lines started going through and then a beam of light brightened the room. He zoomed upwards and Jonathan disappeared in front of the audience, live. A few mo moments later, he reappeared in front of the audience, breathing hard and intense pain. The audience applauded, and they were yelling, and it was crazy. So he did that in front of a live audience. That's and no, and that back at that point in time, I don't know if that's as easy to to do as it would be nowadays. Jonathan had a metal piece to, and had, uh, I think here, he had other metal pieces that he had tested in Osaka, Japan in 1999 by the University of Osaka. They did metallurgy and biotesting, x-rays, etc. They found silicon polymer Beryllium, aluminum, magnesium, copper, zinc, gold, business, and unidentified materials such as plant material, like fibers in a plant leaf, which means that it was a biological living thing, not just a machine. So whatever part they took from this cuff, or they found that, I'll state it again, it was something like plant material, like fibers in a plant leaf, which means it's a biological living thing, not just a machine. As far as phone calls, he stated that from the get-go, his phone calls were being intercepted. He actually lost some of his collected items because he thought he was giving them to a MUFON contactee. When he called the number they gave him, it didn't work. The actual MUFON people he then ended up talking to said they never talked to him. He also did have blood and tissue samples tested from the alien. The results found that there were 46 chromosomes like us, but nine undetermined that were not human. He had three witnesses who worked with him. Their names were Robert Wraith, co-writer of his book. And let's see if I have the name of the book. Uh, I don't think I have it. Um, it's not, you can't find it anymore. In, um, I will put the name of the book in the description below. And if I can't find it here, um, Dr. Harold Chacon, an immunologist, and Dan McAvoy, who is a UFO researcher. So 
Dan McAvoy, a UFO researcher, saw Jonathan disappear with the link cuff on. Now, two other people tried the cuff on who were working with Jonathan, and one died immediately and the other a few days later. Dr. Chacon was a pathologist at the University of Washington who was killed in his office when they were ready to release the results within a week of the samples that were tested. He's taken two lie detector tests and passed both of them. As far as the obelisk, he did go back to the location, but it was gone. But he did say that the plant life around the location was intact and that a tree had all its branches going in one direction. And I'm assuming this is probably a Douglas fir. Now, he stated that he doesn't, he's not going to say where the location was because he didn't want a bunch of people going there and just you know, trampling everything and trying to, to get um, samples and stuff like that. He just decided to just keep that location secret, but he did present another location that was close to it. So, and then here I stated, like I said earlier, that uh, Fact or Fiction did a special on him. And they felt that they could duplicate everything that he, he did, well, which is ridiculous because they don't have the cuff and they didn't have the blood and tissue samples. And um, they didn't have the tests that were done from the metal. Uh, so it's, it's really a bit ridiculous that they even stated that they could copy what he, he was able to do. Last but not least, Jonathan saw Freddie as well as other people with him materialized in front of them. So Freddie actually did go and he did materialize and see Jonathan after they had gone in and taken everything and he lost everything. Jonathan stated that Freddie was a genetically engineered worker. He still communicates with him. And Jonathan feels that Freddie is either from the Orion or Andromeda constellations. So Added to this is the fact that he was literally homeless for a while, and he he just didn't do well. He lost his girlfriend. He's he lost his house, his bank accounts. He lost a lot of a lot of stuff. And then he was on the run. He felt that that um, there were people after him, and he did go into Canada. But then he did go into Mexico, and. Uh, he did get some help from different ufologists and people who are into the field. And he feels that at, at now, and, and I'm saying, when I say now, I'm not saying like now, now, like 2024. Uh, the last interview, which was 2013, he felt that even though he didn't, he didn't want that happening and and he he didn't ask for it. And he was, of all people, he felt he was not the, the right person to have had this interaction. He's grateful for it. He feels that he's he has a job to do, which is to try to figure out how to, to create a technology with that cuff to maybe change how, how we live our lives on this planet. So he's trying to actually work with um, other governments to be able to create technology so that we have the ability to contact other alien races. So whether you believe it or not, it's up to you. Now, I, I believe Jonathan, and I think that the very fact that he's lost everything because of it, um, it's not something that I think a lot of people would be willing to do. And I think that with so many more people coming forward nowadays, that Jonathan's story really isn't that wild and crazy like it used to be years back. No more crazier than Travis Walton's story. But I think that it's a story that needs to be told. And I kind of shortened things up a little bit so that you guys kind of get the gist of, of this story. I always recommend that if you hear anything on this channel to you guys go ahead and do more research on it so you can kind of make that final decision for yourselves if it is something that you believe or you don't believe. So tell me your comments down below if you've heard of this story. And if you haven't, I dug and I was able to find some of the 
the interviews of him. A good place to go to is Art Bell, um, Dark Matter, and you can go to Periscope, and I think you can find the interviews there. He's, uh, you know, he's had a, a tough go of this, and I think that um, it's a story that we should kind of keep alive because there's a lot of people having these experiences, and if we can all come together and just kind of keep this information up to date and and in the mainstream media, I think it's going to help us in the long run. So I hope you enjoyed this story and please do comment down below. Take care and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.